Maybe it's a classic or maybe a flop. Has Katie seen it? She probably has not. She'll sit down and watch it if it's good or it's bad. Hey, have you seen this? No, Katie hasn't seen that. Hi, I'm Katie, and if I had a nickel for every time someone said to me, wait, you haven't seen this movie? Oh my God, you need to see this movie. I'd be very rich. So this is my podcast where I finally watch those movies you all have told me I need to see, and I tell you what I think. Well, hey, howdy. Welcome to another episode of Katie Hasn't Seen That. And oh, I'm excited. Today we got a movie in the genre, one of my most favorite genres. Uh, if you've seen the title of this episode, you already know. We're diving into a horror thriller movie today, and I'm stoked. But before we forget, sometimes you feel like a spoiler and sometimes you don't so be aware we're diving into a movie today there will be spoilers ahead keep that in your back pocket today i'm watching a movie that one of my moderators over on twitch recommended for me gothic mess gothic loves the podcast i don't know if i'm putting words into gothic's mouth i'm like you love my podcast i know gothic gothic enjoys the podcast and so I was like, what movie should I watch this? You got any suggestions? And Jacob's Ladder came up. And Gothic and I like a lot of similar stuff, so I'm really excited to see this. Oh no, Gothic, what if I hate this? <gasps> I don't know, this is, I don't know. We all, we'll see, we'll see what my spicy takes will be if I have any. The season so far has been pretty, I don't know, mild. I haven't had too much. I've just pointed at like problematic things in, in the films that I've watched. But like for the most part, it's been... It's been an interesting journey so far this season. We're already on episode four. I'm watching Jacob's Ladder. It is from the year 1990. Mm. I, I did a chef's kiss. You couldn't hear it. I did it a little bit better. I love the era of the 90s. The decade 1990 to 1999 speaks to me in a way. I don't know if it's because I was a 90s kid. I was kind of a 90s kid on the latter end of the 90s, but I just very much... I don't know. The 90s are just a, just a comfy, nostalgic thing for me. I don't know what it is, but 90s films specifically just have a feel to them. And I get really excited when I get to watch them. And I didn't realize Jacob's Ladder is from the year 1990. So right at the start of a new decade, Jacob's Ladder came out. It is a horror thriller. It is rated R and it comes in at a spicy one hour, 56 minutes. Qu pushing it. It's pushing it. I'm just saying it's pushing that that two hour mark. But if it's a horror film, sometimes I'm okay with that. So we'll see. I, I think horror is seriously one of, if not my most favorite genre of film. I just enjoy it. It's like the excitement. I don't, since I've played so many horror games on my stream, I don't have that like, I'm going to stay awake tonight because the movie was scary feel anymore. I feel like I can watch horror for the most part and not need to keep a light on. However, I did watch The Haunting of Hill House and I did need to keep my light on because that specific show hid ghosts in the background and I went online one night and I looked up, where are the hidden ghosts in Haunting of Hill House? And I found all these screenshots of all the ghosts that were hiding in the background of the scenes in that show and I couldn't sleep that night. <laughs> I still have a fear of the supernatural and of things that are horror adjacent, but I think it's less so since they've played so many horror games. And I'm excited to watch yet another horror film I have not seen. I didn't realize apparently this film is a cult classic, a cult horror classic. I am diving into it for the first time. Tim Robbins is in this. I didn't know Tim Robbins was in this. Uh, apparently, as I'm looking at this, Jason Alexander is also in this. So a couple familiar faces, uh, Louis Black is in this? Wait, wait a second, for real? Louis Black, the comedian. So there, there are some familiar faces in here. I have seen in the past, I'm curious, there's a lot of people in this. I don't wanna look too hard because I don't want anything to pop up that might spoil too much. It's directed by Adrian Lin. I have not heard of them, but who knows? I may have seen something in the past that they have done. Oh, apparently they've worked on Lolita, Fatal Attraction, Indecent Proposal. So, you know, nothing, nothing to sniff at. That is a lot of films that they have worked on. Uh, okay, yes, they, they did a lot of big films. Also, Nine and a Half Weeks, which I think is a comedy. Isn't that a comedy with Hugh Grant? No, it's not. It is very much not that. It is a 1986 American erotic romantic drama film with Kim Basinger and Mickey Rourke. I was thinking of a different film. 
<laughs> um, so this is a film by this director who's done what looks like a lot of maybe psychosexual films. And Jacob's Ladder is a film that I don't know if it's psychosexual film, but is a film that this director has done. So that intrigues me. I have a lot of curiosity diving into this now. Also, what is Jacob's Ladder about? I have no clue. I can't even guess, but I have to because that's how this podcast works. What do I think Jacob's Ladder is about? If I go with my gut instinct, I think it's about a man who buys a house and he finds a well in the backyard that leads to the basement. It's like a well, it's like a, like a stone structure and there's a ladder in it. And I think he goes, I'm just going to crawl down here. I just bought this house. Let me go down this ladder. And when he gets down to the ladder, I think it's going to be a labyrinth world of nightmares and potentially ghosts. The whole point is the ladder dissipates as he climbs down. He has to fight his demons to rebuild a ladder, a ladder to get out. I really do not know what this film is about. I think there might be ghosts. I don't I don't get a feeling there's going to be demons. I don't I don't feel like it's a slasher flick. I think it's going to be supernatural in some way. And perhaps the latter is significant to the mental state of a man named Jacob. That's my guess. I don't know. I'm going to say ghosts and ladders. I think ghosts and ladders. You know how there's like shoots and ladders, the board game? It's going to be ghosts and ladders, except it's not going to be nearly as fun. Probably horrific for whoever Jacob is. All right, let's see what the budget of this film is. Box office. Okay, the budget first. $25 million estimated. That's a lot of money. Again, I'm always shocked at how much movies cost to make, but $25 mil. Apparently, worldwide, it grossed $26,118,851. That's not a lot. However, a lot of these movies that are a little bit more cult, classic-esque do, well, just being in the zeitgeist. I think zeitgeist is the word of Katie Hasn't Seen That. I, it's the unofficial sponsor of Katie Hasn't Seen That. I say zeitgeist too much, and I don't know how else to phrase what I'm trying to say sometimes, but. This movie seems like it's a cult classic. I've not heard of it, really. It's come up over time like, hey, Katie, you should watch Jacob's Ladder. And I'm like, OK, never heard of it. Now I'm going to finally watch it. I'm excited because it's a spooky, scary. Also, Gothic has recommended other horror films to me that I am like, heck, yeah, I liked that one. The, one of them being The Autopsy of Jane Doe. What a wild movie. I got to say, highly recommend that if you're looking for an actual spooky, scary mind trip. Autopsy of Jane Doe, gory, pretty intense, but actually a phenomenal horror movie. And Gothic also recommended that to me. Okay, let's see what the ratings are for Jacob's Ladder. Let's start with the one, the only, internet movie database saying this movie has a 7.4 out of 10. That's not bad. That's a 75%. What is that, like a C? Is that a low grade? I can't remember. I think it's like a C. <laughs> Rotten Tomatoes with a 72%. Okay, I mean, not, not amazing, but not bad. Like, I feel like anything above 70 is usually pretty good. When you start dipping below 69%, giggity, you just start to feel like that's where things are slipping. If something's under 70%, you just feel like stuff is kind of, all right, it's a slow mudslide downhill. Metacritic, 62 See, that's where we're, we're, we're mudslide territory now. 62 is not great. Metacritic is kind of interesting. They're pretty harsh with their numbers. But yeah, 62 is moving into mudslide. And then last but not least, okay, our sweet, sweet Google users being consistent with 86%. This is the standard like number. 86% Google users are like, yeah, I liked it. You know, it's not too bad. I, I will say these numbers are teetering towards the top end. Um, except for Metacritic. I feel like we're, you know, not looking so bad with what this potential could be for Jacob's Ladder. What kind, are ghosts the ladder? Are the ladders built of demon bones? What is Jacob's Ladder? I suppose I'm about to find out. And I'm going to let you all know what I think. All right, I'm back and I watched Jacob's Ladder. I won't lie to you all, it's been a minute since I watched this. 
The SAG after strike was in full effect for quite a few months. This is the year 2023 when I'm recording this. So production of the show took a little bit of a respite in support of the strike. And it seems as if they've reached a an agreement with the studios for fair pay for actors, how AI is used, all that stuff. So I'm back in action and I am trying to keep the wheels turning and I'm diving back in. So I'm going to do my best to get back into the swing of things myself. But I'm here and I'm ready to talk about Jacob's Ladder. And I guess the first thing I need to do is give you all the synopsis of the film courtesy of Rotten Tomatoes. So let's do that thing. After returning home from the Vietnam War, veteran Jacob Singer, played by Tim Robbins, struggles to maintain his sanity. Plagued by hallucinations and flashbacks, Singer rapidly falls apart as the world and people around him morph and twist into disturbing images. His girlfriend, Jessie, and ex-wife, Sarah, try to help him, but to little avail. Even Singer's chiropractor friend, Louis, fails to reach him as he descends into madness. Haven't we all been there where your chiropractor can't even reach you and you just descend into madness? And that is a great way to to summarize this film. It's literally a descent into madness. The movie starts off with helicopters, which might I point out are not CGI. And nowadays I feel like that's real hard to come by. These are like real helicopters. Most things are done on a green screen nowadays and kind of duplicated and cloned and all that. So I just, I I have a real appreciation for real effects and real imagery, such as real helicopters flying through the real sky. And that was just something I noticed right at the beginning of this film is we're, we're starting on this landscape of Vietnam. It's very depressing. We're meeting this cast of characters who are seemingly getting a respite from war. And I, I don't know at first, I was like, this is not what I expected. Uh, I thought this was a horror film. Like, I mean, war in its own way is it's a type of horror. I mean, I was like, maybe this is going a different route. But I grew up watching a lot of war films. And one of the things I noticed is I believe Jacob has glasses on. I wear glasses. I wear contacts. I know how much of an annoyance having glasses is. And Someone wearing glasses during wartime stresses me out. Do they have backup pairs? How does that work? I just, the vision, vision is so important when trying to defend yourself. And I, I just, seeing the glasses in that scenario made me think about, oh my gosh, all of the repercussions if you break those glasses, just everything. This isn't even anything that has to do with the movie. This is just me being stressed about what that means if something happened to those glasses. But I digress. We get this set up, a big freaking fight starts while they're just kind of hanging out, joking around. I couldn't tell if it was Agent Orange being thrown. Just a lot of bad things start occurring. Lots of violent warfare starts up. And then it cuts kind of dramatically to Jacob waking up on a train. Like he was dreaming about this past scenario. And he's walking through the train. He's just kind of getting his bearings. And he sees a lady with a very ominous kind of look. And I was at first, I couldn't tell. But it looks like a tail kind of slithering about that she's like hiding under her coat. At first, I was like, is that a a wiener? (laughs) But I was like, no, I think that's a tail. And at that point, I was like, what is this movie going to be? I have no idea where we're going with this, but I'm along for the ride. Let's see what happens. Then essentially, Jacob gets off, thinks like, maybe I missed my stop, gets off the train and is locked in a train station, which I also feel like would be absolutely horrifying. But this, this fucker thinks the best thing to do is cross the train tracks. I I can't even. Drops down because he couldn't use the stairs tries to cross the tracks before narrowly avoiding getting hit by the train. And they are scary train people. Not just like, whoa, those people seem unsettled. Like, that's not human train people. So, like, this train goes by, narrowly voids, and there's someone in the back of the train just kind of, like, looking. But is not, is not human, maybe. Maybe a demon. I don't know. So, this is what sets up the movie, and I'm immediately, like, transfixed. Like, I don't know how any of this is going to tie together. Uh, but let's see. Let's get the popcorn out and let's find out. One thing I notice about Jacob is looks a little bit like a grown-up Harry Potter. I'm just going to say it just got that look. But also, how tall is Tim Robbins? That dude was tall. I want to see. Tim Robbins is 
six foot five. I could tell. There was a lot of scenes that Tim Robbins was in where I was he was towering over people. And I was like, damn, Tim Robbins got some height. And that's just a fun fact for you in general. It cuts to him getting back to his apartment. They have, the, like, I think his girlfriend. Uh, at first, we don't really know who this person is. There's some sexy time, shower time. And that's another moment I noticed how freaking tall Tim Robbins is. <laughs> and I wrote a note in here. And I just like to say, called it, that says, I think he's dead. Also, not to get super far ahead of myself, but, you know, I'm pretty sure at the end of the film, the boy, the boy is dead. Just saying, I called it pretty early on. But also, you'll see as I, like, keep going through my notes, like, the, the journey I went on. There's also a point where he's spending time with his girlfriend and she's she's just there's a lot of nudity. There's a lot of like, ooh, ooh la la going on. And I wrote in my notes, unnecessary nudity, or is it that we've been trained to be uncomfortable with it? Like we're so comfortable watching films that have so much violence in them and so much like gore and things dictated like that. Or when there's boobs or butts, we automatically get a little uncomfortable. And I think it's just trained in us to Maybe as a society, like as an American, in, in American society to be more aware of those things. I just thought that was an interesting thing that I started asking and reflecting on myself. It's like the whole you watch a film with your parents and there's like a sex scene and you're like, oh my God. But when do you evolve past that? I think as a society, we should evolve past that. Like, how come we're okay with like saving Private Ryan type gore and explosions and violence but like the minute there's boobs on a screen we're all like oh my gosh did you boobs oh that's too much and i think that's just an interesting thing to talk about but there's some there's some boobies in this film just in case you were wondering <laughs> there's a, and there's just like hanging out boobs not like sex scene boobs they're just boob and that's what i think brought that up in me is just kind of going like when do we just kind of go yeah they're just boobs like, let the boobs be free. It's fine. The girlfriend brings in this this bit of Jacob's past. We find out Jacob's got a kid. It was Macaulay Culkin. Not really. Like, the actor Macaulay Culkin was the kid. But when you grew up when I did, Home Alone was huge. Macaulay Culkin has such a memorizable, easy-to-remember face. So when you see Macaulay Culkin, you just go, yep, that's that's... Kevin McAllister. <laughs> but when I saw it, I was like, oh, it's Macaulay Culkin, which apparently he wasn't credited in this film. He didn't get a credit in this film, but he's such a recognizable person that I wrote in my notes. Whoa, Macaulay Culkin was his kid? The girlfriend brings these notes. You can tell that Jacob's a little bit like bothered by getting those old photos. It sounds like there is this old life that Jacob had, but Jacob has a girlfriend now and this girlfriend burns the photos which I thought was a very drastic thing, just kind of takes this box of memories and just dumps it in, a, in an incinerator. I don't know. Is that the best thing for Jacob? Maybe tuck it under the bed. Have a few sleeps. Think, of, think about it. Think about it before you permanently destroy pictures. This movie came out in 1990. We didn't have the same kind of digitization and things we can do nowadays with photos and things of that nature. So I just, I don't know. That was a very final move that Jezebel pulled for Jacob. And I just was a little bit shocked by that. Jacob also frequents a chiropractor. I also have started seeing a chiropractor. So that's just an unnecessary fun fact for you. But I really wanted to sneak that in. Uh, the chiropractor is working on Jacob. Twists his head and we get another vision. And that's what this movie's littered with. It's just like littered with visions and, and what seems like symbolism and, and things that kind of leave you going, wait, what's going on? What's happening? I don't understand. And I liked that they were building mystery. The flashbacks were very interesting as they were peppered throughout and very, sometimes very jarring between the what's considered present day and what's in the past. Gets out of the chiropractor visit, Jacob's on his merry way, and then he gets chased by a car down an alley. And I'm like, is someone trying to kill him? So for most of this movie, I'm sitting there like, what on earth is going on? Mark's watching it with me and going like, is this kind of like a Bible story? This feels like it's got some biblical themes to it. So I wrote that down and I do believe that this film has biblical symbolism and metaphors weaved throughout it, though I'm not entirely sure if there's like something specific. You can just tell 
that there is some sort of overarching demons angels vibe to it. Jacob goes to the hospital. There's no record of Jacob at the hospital. And there was like horns on the nurse's head. So this is the thing. Like there's these normal everyday scenarios that Jacob's in and there's these abnormal things happening, but it's just like glimpses of it. So it's the sanity of Jacob is being tested and us as viewers is being tested. Like the tail on the train, the, the face in the back of the train, the demon horns on the nurse's head. It made me start to think, is Jacob in purgatory? So I evolved from, I think Jacob's dead to, is Jacob in purgatory? Maybe it's that. So as I'm going throughout this thing, throughout this whole movie, I'm like trying to come up with the philosophical, like what's happening here? Because there isn't really anything that's like black and white. You don't show up to the film. You're like, these two people are going on a date and this is the progression of the date. And then will they, will they end up together? Or films that just kind of lay things out for you super clearly. This one's more of a thinker and this one's more of like, I don't even think mystery is the right word to put it. It's just a trip that you're going on. You're like sitting down, you're buckling up and you're like, I have zero clue what's happening. And I really hope that we figure it out by the end. It's just wild. This movie is from 1990. It felt like a movie from the 80s, which makes sense. It's right on that cusp of the 80s. And I feel like those first years, like 89, 90, 91, or say like 79, 80, 81, those timeframes have these transitional periods. So this film felt more like it leaned 80s style, which makes sense. Don't know why I made a note about that, but I felt like it had more of an 80s feel than a 90s. I then move on to say, is Jezebel a demon? I think there is a lot of symbolism in this. And I also wrote, what a weird movie. Because it is. It's a little bit of a weird movie. They go to a party. He's got his glasses on. I'm pretty sure his glasses fall on the ground. Real lucky those didn't get broken. There is this dance going on with Jezebel. And she's vibing with what seems like Cthulhu tentacles or some sort of demon-esque phallicness going on and she's dancing and bumping and grinding up on it i was wondering if this was a sin representation also the girlfriend's name is jezebel so i'm sitting there like there's definitely a breakdown of biblical themes in this so we're diving in there's this party where his girlfriend's dancing with what seems like the devil and cut forward jacob's got a massive fever 106 degree fever. His girlfriend's trying to take care of him. Just like, oh my God, you have like the one of the worst fevers ever. And also 106 degree fever is real bad. Your brain's going to start baking if you don't take care of that. She recruits like all the neighbors and is like, get him in an ice bath. I, I'm pretty sure like, I mean, the neighbors got to see a lot of Jacob that night, but it was really nice to see the community rallying around Jacob to try to take care of him and save him from dying because. Sometimes those fevers, you don't get enough time to get to the hospital and your body just completely shuts down. So this is where we get another flashback. I'm trying to figure out what's happening. In this flashback, Jacob is back with his ex-wife, Sarah, the little kid that we see in the pictures. Macaulay Culkin comes in and is like, I'm cold. So the dad gets up. Jacob takes Macaulay Culkin back to bed. We find out there's other kids, but apparently... Macaulay Culkin is the golden child <laughs> for some reason. In this kid's bedroom, I, I couldn't tell if there was someone in the mirror. I can't remember if I just saw it out of the corner of my eye, but I feel like there's like little sneak-ins of creepy stuff in a lot of the scenes in this movie. So I'm sitting there thinking, Jacob's just having a fever tub dream. So not only having like a fever dream, but having a fever tub dream. And this, I'm like, is not reality. This is him just going back. In the dream, Jacob says that, him dating Jezebel was a really bad nightmare or a really bad dream. And I'm like, damn, shade to Jezebel. She's trying to save your life right now. The movie does a good job layering, like, as a viewer, like, what's reality? What's happening? I have zero clue. At this point, I'm asking all the questions. And I'm, I'm riveted because I'm like, I don't know what's going on. And my puzzle brain wants to figure it out. There's a point where he asks, am I dead? And I go, oh, crap, my my guess is wrong. It's too obvious now if he asks that and I guessed it. So they're definitely not going to make him dead at the end. Boy, was I wrong. Because you know how they do like the obvious thing and you're like, oh, crap, they're not going to do that. 
they, they did that. Him asking if he was dead. He he was correct. I think he was on the path to being dead. And I'm, I'm again getting ahead of myself. But I just really thought it was a wild trip to get from point A to point B of this film. And even as I'm talking about it, I'm still like taking in the battiness of the journey. It's just such a mind trip. I feel like Jezebel, as much as she cares about Jacob, is aloof and not understanding about his past. Like Jacob is a vet, came from a very horrible war, Vietnam. This is also a moment where I didn't know where the movie was going. I had zero clue what was happening, zero clue what was going to go on. And then all of a sudden, I my second guess of, is he in purgatory? He's now looking into that in the film. He's like searching through things like, am I in purgatory? I wrote a funny joke in here that I really enjoy is that, you know, Jacob and Jezebel are fighting or having disagreements. And I said, she has resting demon face. I think that's pretty great. I think I nailed that one. Let me know if you enjoyed that joke. <laughs> it's also at this point where Jacob gets a call from a, an old war buddy. And they go to a bar to meet and find out they're having similar experiences, visions and all these things. Paul says, his friend is named Paul, says, I'm going to hell. And I'm like, this has to be purgatory. Literally, this movie is me with one of those boards with all the strings attached to it. I'm like, I'm going to figure this out. Not like I'm going to win anything if I do. But this movie makes you go, I need to figure out what's happening. They hang out at the bar. Jacob's like, oh my gosh, I feel seen. We're going to figure this out together. Paul gets in the car and the car explodes. So then once again, just as I feel like I'm figuring things out, I definitely feel like I am not. <laughs> There's just a point where I'm like, what's going on here? There's a guy who came out to help. I'm wondering, is there a guardian angel now? There's so much biblical things you can kind of pull into this story. Paul meets his old war buddy, explodes. Then we get to the funeral for Paul and all of the other war buddies are kind of like reminiscing and going like, oh yeah, I'm also having all these wild experiences. So then again, I'm like, this is another twist I didn't expect. They go, let's get in touch with a lawyer. Let's try to make a class action lawsuit. The lawyer is uh, Jason Alexander, who is from Seinfeld. And I, that was neat to see. And then I feel like someone's following Jacob and it's like this paranoia thing. I start writing things. He wasn't in Vietnam. Was he discharged for psychological issues and his whole crew? It just starts going down a rabbit hole. All of his war buddies go, I don't want to be a part of this lawsuit anymore. It's almost like it was weird. It was like a, like a light switch got flipped. And so Jacob's upset, obviously. It's like, I just, I don't know what to do. I have no support. I feel like I'm, I'm going crazy. He goes out and gets somehow attacked by these people, thrown in a car, and Jacob puts up a fight, jumps out of the car. It's around the holidays, so one of those Santas on the corner is ringing a bell, comes over and steals Jacob's wallet. So then by the time he gets to the hospital, because somebody hopefully was like a kind enough citizen of Earth to go, hey, there's a man on the ground who's real hurt. <laughs> He gets to the hospital. He's mumbling about how he jumped out of a car and Santa stole his wallet. So they think he's crazy and put him in an asylum. And they just start going down this asylum rabbit hole in the film. And I was literally lost at this point. I was just kind of going, this is bouncing all over the place. And I wrote in my notes that I think this is a commentary on how we treat our veterans in America and in our country. And how we don't give them space to talk, don't give them the care that they need, don't give them the patience. And I think in a way, I was kind of right about that, that this is a commentary on how we treat our veterans and how much better we can do, especially for serving the country that we live in and trying to keep us safe and protect us, especially back in the Vietnam era when they came home. We're in this asylum. This is where we are introduced to the head shake. And if you play any horror games, you know what the head shake is. It's like when stuff's shaking and it's blurring and it's just the head moving. It's pretty unnerving. It's pretty horrifying. Mark told me that this was the first film in which I think that technique was ever used. And I, if that's true, it's literally changed the game and many horror movies in general. The head shake is pretty quintessential horror. I've always enjoyed that effect. And if this was the origin point of that, let me know because I'm very curious about the head shake. 
He's in the asylum. He somehow gets his chiropractor to show up and take him. I, I don't know what kind of sway chiropractors have, but clearly I should really keep my chiropractor in my back pocket just in case. I still don't know what's going on. This is where the movie starts to lose me a bit. This is where I go, okay, I think my brain has done so many mental gymnastics at this point. I think I may have put too much pressure on figuring out what was happening instead of enjoying the ride that I started to feel like the wheels are coming off for me. Like he knew the kid was going to get hit with the bike. Then he meets a chemist. Then we start talking about military, bad drugs, warfare. The chemist being in introduced kind of started to throw me off. The drugs that were allegedly given to these veterans that affected them greatly and being experimented on, that starts to unfold. They all fought each other in that opening sequence. They didn't fight the what was, quote unquote, the enemy at the time. They were fighting each other. And at the beginning of the film, Jacob's in the forest, like m trying to sneak around and gets a bayonet to the stomach. And that's how the film opens up after that epic, that epic scene. And we find out that they weren't fighting the enemy. They were fighting each other. Then they start doing pictures. You can feel the film kind of winding down. There's flashes of Jacob's life, the slow of the heartbeat. And you go, oh. I was right. He is dead and he was in the process of dying. The kid on the stairs, aka Macaulay Culkin's back, grabs his hand, leads him up the stairs. I wrote, was he in purgatory and just accepted he was dead? I felt like this film portrayed death as the scariest and saddest way to go. I really felt like this film was a punch in the gut for anyone who has a fear about dying. Like, what a tormented, just absolutely gut-wrenching way to experience your last moments of life because there's like a medical tent. Jacob's laying down. He's smiling when he dies because I think his kid grabs his hand who passed away and leads him upstairs to like bright, warm sunlight. So it's kind of like the ending was was... He accepted his death. He was ready to move on. It was like the last moment was happy. But every moment up until that was just absolute like pain and confusion. That got me thinking about when we die, what happens? Nobody, I mean, there's always people who have near death experiences and share what their thoughts of like, this is what happens. Or I died for five minutes. They brought me back. And this is what I experienced. I, I don't know that we ever really know for sure, but this brought up a lot of stuff that I think I enjoyed thinking about more than actually watching the film. I think watching the film once was enough for me. I don't know that I, I'd ever really want to <laughs> watch it again. I think that it really brought up a lot of things that make you, can bring up a lot of fear. It's like a true psychological horror. Jacob's last moments in life definitely were horrifying. They were sad. And it, it just brings up things that make you think like when we do eventually reach that transition point in our lives, is it going to be scary like that? Are we going to go through our lives and be confused about it? Are we going to go through our lives and try to figure out the steps we took and how we could correct them? Are we going to try to unravel a mystery? Is it just a fearful moment right before one good one? So if you want to watch Jacob's Ladder and have a little bit of an existential crisis, get this on your books. Get a little watch it. I'm assuming if you're listening to this, you already watched this film. What do you think about the ending? I really do feel like they portrayed the ending of someone's life through these horrible circumstances just in a true psychological oh sh kind of way. What did I think of Jacob's Ladder? I think it was a commentary on veterans. I think it brought up a very interesting philosophical discussion on what death is, what purgatory means, heaven and hell, where we end up in the in-between, those things of life and death. I, I think this movie is really sad and kind of depressing. I'm not mad that Gothic made me watch this. <laughs> I think it really brought up some things that I didn't expect. I think that the film wasn't what I expected at all. When I was like, oh, horror, it's going to be ghosts. It's going to be a haunted house. I didn't expect it to be a psychological trip. And I think that if anybody's ever interested in checking out Jacob's Ladder, you should watch it. 
I can't say that I loved this film, but I'm not sure that you're supposed to love it. Because at the end of the film, there's like a little end card that kind of comes up and it mentions the drug BZ that it claims American government reportedly tested on its soldiers but denied the allegations. So I, I think at times the film was a bit convoluted. It lost me a few times in the constant twists and turns. I loved the horror elements of the film. I thought they were effective. I cared about Jacob. I felt bad for him and this journey that he was going on. And then when the end hits, it's like a gut punch of like, damn, that is that sucks to have to go through all of that. This huge fight, this huge like, am I am I losing my mind? Where am I? What is this? Just bringing you to the end point of like, it's time to go. But I do think Jacob, in my opinion, accepted the fate of the situation and went, all right, it's time to go. I guess that's my thoughts on Jacob's Ladder. I'm very curious to hear what you all think. Is it worth watching the 2019 version or did they do the thing where they remade it too soon? Just stick with the 1990. I, I don't know. I think this film made me think but I can't tell how I feel about it. That's the, This film really kind of wrestles with my brain a bit. And so I'm not really sure exactly where I was going to land. I wasn't sure exactly where I was going to land with my rating. And I really puzzled over this. But I was going to give it. I gave it actually an extra one. Because at first I was like, I don't know where I fall. I was just, I'm literally at that like 50-50 point on this film. Where I can't really tell how I feel about it. So I originally was at a 5. But I added a plus to it, and I'm giving it a 6 out of 10. Is he dead? Fake outs. They faked me out so many times. They took me on a journey. I didn't know where I was going. That's what I thought about Jacob's Ladder. Please tell me what you think about it. And before we wrap this up, I obviously got comments from you coming up. But I also have some trivia which I'm really excited to share. This is these, There's some fun trivia with this movie, and I, I think this also made me appreciate the film more. I think it's worth watching at least once. I think Jacob's Ladder is worth getting in your brain, and that's one of the trivia points. It is included among the 1001 movies you must see before you die, which was edited by Steven Schneider. So it's on a very... I mean, that's a lot of movies. 1001 movies? Dude, that makes me wonder. This movie broke my brain. This, this makes me think, like, how many movies am I going to watch before I die? But I don't want to really think about that too hard, so let's just keep on going. <laughs> All the SFX were filmed live with no post-production, which kudos to them. Freaking love that kind of stuff. For example, to achieve the famous shaking head effect, the director simply filmed the actor waving his head around and keeping his shoulders and the rest of his body completely still at four frames per second resulting in an incredibly fast and deeply disturbing motion when played back at the normal frame rate of 24 frames per second. That makes me feel like I want to try to do that at some point and see if I can replicate it. So, uh, and if any of you want to replicate the shaking head effect, hopefully that helps. This movie also served as a major inspiration to the early games in the Silent Hill franchise. I still got Silent Hill on my list to play at some point. I love that tidbit. I think that's a really fun, like, way to pay homage to this movie. And it makes me more excited to play the Silent Hill series when the remakes come out. The hospital gurney that carries Jacob was deliberately unbalanced by the director. He raised one wheel slightly off the floor, causing it to rattle and spin. And that was such a stressful scene when Jacob's being wheeled through the asylum and there's just body parts and blood everywhere. I guess I didn't really talk about that too much. But what was that about? The asylum being an absolute horrifying place to be, the equipment being used, the things being done to Jacob, all of that, absolutely horrifying. That is some really, like if you've played a game like Outlast, when you're in asylums and there's just that body horror and the, the experimentation, that stuff is freaking terrifying and very scary. Thought that the director captured that very well. So there you have it. There's some trivia from Jacob's Ladder. And up next, here's some comments from all of you. Hey gang, I'm back with some comments from all of you. And let's just dive right in. I'm on my way to a yoga class. I have been so stressed out today. The day that I'm recording this, my internet went down. It's been a whole thing. I'm going to yoga and hopefully it'll help me. So let's just get into some comments from all of you on our last episode on the movie Predator. And we had such a cool discussion about this film. And I hope we have a similar one 
to Jacob's Ladder. So first up from Twitter, we got Faster Than Light, who said, in the sequels and Dark Horse comics, Predator can switch to different types of vision ranging from infrared to high spectrum light ranges, giving them more views. I recommend Alien vs. Predator, even though many didn't like it. Skip Alien vs. Predator Requiem, however. Hey man, I liked them both. <laughs> I'm down for all the Alien vs. Predators, I gotta tell you. So I really appreciate this though. I didn't know there were comics, so I learned something new. And I also learned a little bit of extra info about the Predator vision. Up next from YouTube, Rod Johnston 69 said, The Predator is like rich dudes who hunt lions in Africa. And oh my God, you are right. You are 100% right. When I read that, I was like, that is exactly what this is. They're coming to Earth and hunting us like on a safari. And that is terrifying. Up next, we have a comment from Francisco M7849, who says, One of the things that I like about Predator when I was older, instead of being a small young kid watching it, is that understanding that each one of the members of the team had a particular either characteristic or quirk or personality, and it was not just a generic team. They were just going to get wiped out when one after the other, as each one died, you actually were like felt bad that each of the guys got killed. I get what you mean 100%. I feel like they well rounded out these characters and it really did feel like a loss when the characters died in Predator. I think that's hard to do. There's so much stuff I watch nowadays where I'm like, nah, oh, all right. I guess that happened. Not a big deal. But in this movie, in the amount of time that they had, I feel like they did an amazing job building out these characters. And then when they did eventually die, you actually felt something. So up next, also from YouTube, this lovely comment from the A Bullet Away. And uh, it's a long post, so I'm gonna just focus on one of the parts. I really appreciate when y'all share your thoughts. You have no idea how much I appreciate it. I love getting people's perspective, hearing different information. I get so many new bits of like fun facts and things I would never have known had y'all hadn't said something in the comments. So the part I wanted to focus on in Bullet Away's comment was right here in the middle where it says, while there had been gore in films before the 80s, the 80s brought a sense of realism to it. Yes, a lot of it was over the top and there were a lot of bad special makeup effects during that time, but it also gave some of the best pre-CGI effects we've ever seen from Friday the 13th and Day of the Dead. Both films special effects done by, oh gosh, I'm gonna try to say the name, Tom Savini, to films like Predator, An American Werewolf in London, The Howling, The Thing, and Aliens. Everything was new. These movies raised the bar. They were iconic for many reasons. I could not agree more. I love practical effects. I feel like these movies did something special, and I prefer practical effects to CGI any day. So I just love that part of your comment, and I really wanted to focus on that because in Predator specifically, that was one of my favorite things is the the monster makeup, the, the way they designed the costume for the Predator, just all of that really felt special. And I really agree with you that in the 80s, they kind of honed in on that and they made something special with that. And I kind of, I love when movies go back to it. I wish more movies would do practical effects. And whenever they do, I'm always like, yes, this is amazing. And last but not least, a comment from White Flash 22 who said, I was really surprised when I first watched Predator and enjoyed it. It's great. I was even more surprised when you watched it and thought similarly. So, I mean, I guess I'm always full of surprises. What did y'all think of this episode, though, on Jacob's Ladder? Give me your thoughts. See if you can pop up in this section of the, the video slash podcast where I share comments from all of you. I appreciate y'all discussing stuff with me. It's one of my favorite parts of the podcast. So, until next time, I'll catch you on the flip side. If you want to hang out with me more, or if you just want to yell at me for my thoughts on a specific movie, I stream over on Twitch at www.twitch.tv slash katiepetersplays. If you'd like to support the podcast and buy me a coffee to fuel my reviews, you can over on Ko-fi at www.ko-fi.com slash katiepetersplays. You can join my Discord to discuss the movies I review with other Katie Hasn't Seen That fans by visiting discordapp.com slash invite slash Katie Peters Plays. If you enjoy Katie Hasn't Seen That, please leave a five-star rating and review wherever you listen to your podcasts. It helps others find the show. 
Also, feel free to follow and chat with me on Twitter at PlayKatiePlay and on Instagram and YouTube at Katie Peters Plays. Music written and performed by Mark Can Do It. Katie Hasn't Seen That is a part of the Geek Generation Network.